My name is Laura Kovacs. I'm the executive producer of Author Events, and I'm honored to introduce our guests this evening. For Lydia Bastianich, the godmother of Italian-American cuisine, sharing food is a way to connect and nurture. She is the author of more than a dozen beloved culinary guides, owner of celebrated Italian restaurants in Manhattan, Pittsburgh, and Kansas City, and an Emmy Award-winning public television host. An array of honors across her remarkable career includes several James Beard Awards and induction into the Culinary Hall of Fame. She last visited the Free Library with her 2019 memoir titled My American Dream, and she joins us this evening with her new cookbook, Lydia's From Our Family Table to Yours. Tonight is doubly special as Ms. Bastianich will be joined in conversation with Heather Merrill Thomason, named one of Food and Wine Magazine's 15 visionaries who will revolutionize the way we eat and the founder of Philadelphia's Primal Supply Meats. Please welcome our guests to the Free Library. Hello, everyone. I'm just a little bit nervous uh, because we have Lydia. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Lydia, do you remember what it felt like the first time you met Julia Child? Were you nervous? Because I think I that's how I feel now. <laughs> I, I, I was nervous, uh, but uh, the setting, maybe I need to just put it in a setting. It was when I opened for Lydia. So I started my first restaurant in 1971 in Queens, uh, I was rather young with my husband. We opened one restaurant, then was doing fine. We opened another little one. We sold those, and after 10 years, you know, I kind of, because I wasn't a chef from the beginning. I cooked, uh, I, whatever, but I didn't have any real professional training in a sense. So in those first 10 years, I entered the kitchen, became the sous chef to the chef that we hired, and by 81, I was ready. Now, uh, um, in 81, we opened for Lydia, which was on 58. We sold the other two, we opened for Lydia. And uh, there I became the chef. But also, the difference was that, you know, when I came to the States, uh, the Italian cuisine in the States was different than in America. It's the Italian-American cuisine. And it's a great cuisine, delicious, but it's different. For those of you that have been to Italy, you know that each region in Italy is quite different and the food is different. And I said, well, you know, I think maybe I'll really will cook like we cook at home, the regional food of Italy. I did sort of combine a little bit of the Italian-American. So, 81, this young American uh, woman, chef, cooks this strange Italian regional food, uh, and, you know, who is she? So I was a kind of a curious item on, on, on the block and uh, journalists, of course, but uh, Julia Child also wanted to, to come in and see, and she called for reservation, and I knew she was coming. But, uh, you know, would you have to understand that at that point in my life, I didn't understand the magnitude also of Julia, you know? <laughs> I, I, you know, I knew, I watched her on television or whatever, I, but uh, she came in, so I was ready, and, you know, uh, she came in on her reservation, and she walks in with James Beard, James Beard. <laughs> so, the two of them, you know, big, both, both very big uh, individuals. And um, they came in, and, uh, you know, they looked at the menu, they wanted, of course, I wanted to talk. So, was I really, really nervous? I was nervous, because I was nervous just, you know, in the restaurant. This was about six or seven months into the opening. Uh, but... As I said, I didn't know how grand or big or whatever she was. So I kind of, uh, uh, we started talking. She wanted to know about risotto. She wanted to um, uh, have risotto. She came back, she had the risotto again, and ultimately she wanted me uh, to teach her how to make it. So we became friends. And actually, being on television is due to her because she invited me to be on her show, which was the Master Chef series. And the producer said, after we were finished with two episodes, she said, oh, Lydia, you're pretty good. How about a show of your own? 
and that's how, you know, uh, and we were talking in the back about our profession and how does one, especially being a woman, how do you grow, how do you make things happen? And, uh, uh, you know, I guess you have to identify opportunities and, and, and take them, but you have to be ready to, in a sense, to take them. And I don't know if I was ready or not, but I says, I'm going, sure, why not? But I asked for two things, that I be on PBS and that we film it in my home because I was not used to studios, cooking in studios, yeah. So till this day, now we still film the show in my home. I love this. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I think your risotto is actually what made you famous. It's what Julia wanted to learn from you. I, I had such a good time. I was looking through the, uh, the various New York Times reviews of Felidia over the years, and Mimi Sheraton came there, and Ruth Reichel wrote a beautiful, beautiful review. Fifteen years after you opened, she was still talking about how New Yorkers and Americans weren't really ready for the real Italian food that you were cooking. Right. And, uh, and I read... Um, a review from Frank Bruni, and he said something like, talking about a, a beet and goat cheese, I believe, a Humboldt fog risotto that you made for him, and he said, a risotto like that could put pasta out of business. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, the, the, the risotto, because when I started in 71, now to make good risotto, you need uh, 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 the short grain rice. Now, there's more than a thousand different species of rice. You know, rice is the most common food in the world. It fed the most amount of people in the world than any other food. So it's been around for a while. And, but to make a good risotto, you need a short grain rice, whether it's canaroli or arborio. And the short grain rice, the qualities of it is that when you slowly cook it and, and you have the right technique, it, it, it uh, sort of the, the starches seep out. And that's what makes the risotto creamy. So when I first opened in 71, the first restaurant, there was no short grain rice oh, in America. No. no, we only had the Uncle Ben's, the long grain. <laughs> and uh, I know my father, he loved risotto, and he insisted on making risotto, my mother and I, whatever I would help. And uh, uh, every time he ate it, he says, but this is not the same. Said, of course it's not, it's a different rice. So it was difficult even for restaurants to do the risotto, not only the technique is unique because you have to, it's simple but it's unique, but they didn't have the product. And so uh, when I went, when I opened Felidia in 81, by then we were beginning to get the short grain rice and... Uh, I didn't even think about that part, that the risotto is like, you have to take all this time and care and you have to keep serving it, uh, stirring it, and you have to serve it right away. So in your restaurant you would... For 20 minutes, would you stand at the stove you made, to you serve made it, the perfect uh, yeah, risotto? Yeah, you made it uh, at all <laughs> the time for whenever the order order came in, and wow. uh, and uh, you you had a little pot, and it was difficult also because you have a little pot. Let's say that you have uh, a restaurant that sits 70 people or 80 people, and uh, five of them order risotto, in five little pots, five, five <laughs> fires are are you know. So I, I remember the chefs always used to get get mad at the at the waiters. Can't you suggest the same risotto to another table? <laughs> Don't bring me one with seafood, one with mushrooms. Suggest the same one so I can make them together. Uh, so okay, you. I love hearing these stories. Uh, I was really hoping to kind of go back here with you. Um, so I loved learning that. You know, you owned and, and operated two restaurants before you really became a chef in the sense that it wasn't until Felidia, your third restaurant, where you are a chef in the sense that you are, it's your own vision and it's your cooking and you, it is 1981 and you're serving Americans who think Italian food is pizza and pasta and you're serving them risotto and polenta with calves liver. And, and I think to myself like, Oh, she is so brave. Like, that is so courageous. But I don't know, you're telling me this Julia story, and maybe it's just like, it's just you being you. Maybe that is the benefit, is that you didn't know how big the stage would become. Uh, partly is that, yes. You don't really realize, uh, you know, what's in front of you. You just forge ahead with yeah. a knowledge, a belief that you have. And, you know, if uh, you, you think if all of Italy, all of these years, ate this food and everybody loves coming to Italy and ever must be good so yeah. I'm gonna cook it <laughs> sooner or later they're gonna like it and uh, so on that premises but I was also quite conscious uh, 
uh, of of the, the sort of the could be a, a, a little bit of discrepancy. So I would uh, uh, cook chicken parmigiana things, give them those options. But you know what I did, uh, Heather? I did that um, a lot of times I would cook things like like we had friends that were hunters and they would bring whole uh, 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 venison or whatever. Now you can't, you know, you know that Europe, which you can't uh, do that. But we used to get wild uh, meat in there and I would make this guazzetto, this sauce with venison. And with it, I would make some polenta, and that's very traditional in the area that we come from. You know, it's winter, my grandfather was a hunter, you know, whether it was a hare or, or, or a, a little deer or something, and the polenta would always go with it. And I would make it, and whatever they ordered, I would bring a little plate on the side of polenta venison. I said, you gotta taste this, this is good. So I would kind of bring it to the, to the and I think, you know, people uh, built a sense of comfort and, and trust. And trust. Yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. That you had to kind of slowly introduce them and sort of bring them over to what is your true Italian cooking. Exactly, yeah. So, okay, so not only in the 1980s are you groundbreaking, that is really what you were doing, whether you realized it or not, by cooking this authentic Italian food, but you're also a woman. And uh, you know, you're a woman chef succeeding in a male-dominated field, which I can relate to as a female butcher. <laughs> I bet. Um, who were who were your mentors at the time? Like, who were women that you were looking up to? Well, my my uh, uh, sort of uh, I would say my passion eventually uh, what I became actually started when I was uh, a child. So you see. Maybe I'll explain a little bit. You read my biography, so where, where I was born in Istria. Istria is no longer Italy, it is now Croatia. But it is, if you go up by Venice, uh, right across the, 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 the sea there, there's a little peninsula, and now it is Croatia. After World War II, Italy lost the war, and uh, that part was part of the Paris Treaty, the settlement of the aftermath of the war, who gets what, and that part, Istria was given to the newly formed communist Yugoslavia. And I was just born around the time. So it was a difficult time also for food, for everything. And um, even though we, we were Italian, uh, uh, communism came, they changed our name. You know, when you're, when you're on a border, wherever in the world you are on a border, you're, you're not just one ethnicity. You are what you feel in the house, that's Italian, but you also connect to the other ones. You, we spoke the other two languages. We spoke a little bit of Slavic. We spoke a little bit of German because the Austro-Hungarians are also there. And, and, uh, and so uh, it's, it's uh, you know, we were behind, behind the Iron Curtain and we had to speak uh, Croatian. My mother was a school teacher. She was, uh, uh, she had to go in the Communist Party. That's part of why we left also. My father was uh, in prison because he, he was a mechanic, but he had two little trucks, and he was deemed a capitalist. So there were a lot of things that, and my parents put my brother and I with my grandmother, who was a little bit on the outskirts of the big city of Kula, and she would supply the food for everybody. So we had, uh, in the court here where I live, we had chicken, we had ducks, we had geese, we had rabbits, we had goats, we had two pigs every year, and this was all produced the food for the family. And uh, you know, I was the little helper, the runner around, I wasn't, but I would, I would help. I remember when we had the November, the slaughter of the pigs and all that, the first thing that my grandmother did is you know, with the pot there, catching the blood. And we would do the blood sausages. And you know, I was a little, I was, they would give me a wooden spoon and I would mix and she would put in there some raisins and she would put in some cornmeal and whatever. So I was around, you know, she would say, okay, go get me the rosemary, go get me the bay leaves, go get the tomato, the potatoes, out of, and I would go with the potatoes out of the ground. You know. This was just, I was involved, goats, milk and goat, we made ricotta, you know, all of these things, I was involved somewhat, not intentionally, but just as a helper. And, and, and that, that was the beginning of my, I, uh, I recorded all of those, evidently, I recorded all of those flavors in this, yeah. uh, at that age, and I, my library of, of all these flavors is still with me, I still. When we finally escaped back into Italy, 
And uh, my, uh, my parents, of course, didn't tell us that we were going. And I realized that I hadn't said goodbye to grandma because, you know, it was a secret sort of a situation. And uh, food, a while back then, I remember, why did I cook all this food? Why did I, even in, in Italy with, my, uh, with the aunt and whatever, cook this food? It was because food brought me back to grandma, to that place. And so, you know, my um, connection my, to food has remained with me. I still, you know, I am who I am and I express myself uh, with cooking for people, nurturing people, and uh, bring me back to a, a beautiful place when I was a, a small uh, child. So you never, you never really felt uh, sort of lonely, I guess, as a woman among men, because you had these strong women that brought you up, well, and it sounds like you you carried them with you. Well, you know, I, I was, I was. It was a little bit uh, uh, strange being a woman, especially. I noticed it more from from the outside than from me, you know, because in Italy, a woman is in the kitchen. Yeah. Even in the in the uh, uh, osterias or trattorias that you go, the husband is out uh, drinking and saying hello to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> the woman is in the kitchen cooking. So you know, I mean, it wasn't a, a a big revelation for me. I think what I had the protection also my husband because my husband ah. my husband was the one that really wanted to open a restaurant. He was also an immigrant and he came here. He worked in restaurants and ultimately that's when we opened the restaurant. And I said, well, I'll help you. But along the way, I mean, when I was in Italy, we were in, in a refugee camp, and I went to school with the nuns. I ended up in the kitchen because to subsidize my, my schooling, pay for it. So they put me in the kitchen. That was my first commercial kitchen, and so on. When, I, when we came to the States, you know, I was, uh, I think when I was 14, uh, uh, I, I, uh, we lived across the street from Walken's Bakery, which was mm -hmm. Christopher Walken. And, um, uh, you know, I was always kind of a big girl, and I applied. I wanted a, a, a job, a part-time job uh, in the bakery, selling or whatever. And they took me, so I worked in the bakery for quite a few years. That's why um, I'm still friends with Christopher and the family. Uh, and uh, I got in the bakery. Not only did I sell and whatever, but I ended up in the back. Did you whenever. learn to bake? I, I, yes, I, I, de decorating was more because, you know, ah. they did a lot of the baking. What I ended up doing was when all the, the, the kind of the, the, the bakers went home and whatever, somebody came in, needed a birthday cake or needed this. So I would pipe and I would add, so I, I got that. that uh, uh, so along the way, I always ended up uh, uh, working. Uh, but uh, in the restaurant, I had the protection, I guess, of my husband, the family. But, you know, and, 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 and being a woman also, you know, I say this because I get asked a lot. I never felt that a profession has gender. You know, I never felt, you know, I'm a woman, I can't do that. Yeah. Uh, and I always tell all the women, I says, you've got to be the best that you can at what you want to do. If you have passion, invest in yourself, become the best, go out there, and don't look at the gender. Don't, you know, just do it. And I think that your work, your product, will speak for itself. I remember we had, you know, you do a lot of, in our industry, you do a lot of fundraising, and I know that you, you do, you're involved in a lot in the community. And um, these fundraisers, ultimately, all these French chefs with the toque came out, you know, <laughs> and I was, I never had a toque, I never wore a toque because, uh, and. They're so uh, silly. Yeah? <laughs> They're so silly. <laughs> and uh, and uh, they, I felt a little bit, but you know, I, I never, f I never, I was kind of, you know, I felt good about what yeah. I was doing. I loved it. At the end of every event, they all came to eat my stuff. So, you know, <laughs> that, that reaffirmed. Yeah. 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 That reaffirmed. I'm still friend. I saw Jacques uh, the other day. I'm st we're still friend with all of those uh, uh, French. I, I get the impression that you have always had a very strong sense of yourself and who you are, and that comes through in your food, too. So I think it's carried you a long way. I think, I think that you know you have to sort of believe in what you do. If you have a passion, uh, I feel that you know I was given a gift. I, the gift is not mine to keep. I need to make the best out of it and bring it out there, whether it is to feed my family or to, to do a profession uh, as I do. I, I felt always, also, you know what, is the, the, the route of my life, you know, 
being uh, under communism, the difficulties, then being two years in a refugee camp, then uh, ultimately coming to the United States, that was in 1958, I was 12 years old, and we didn't have anybody here. The Catholic Charities brought us here. So, you know, all of that, it, it, they're all hurdles to overcome in one's life. And I think that uh, they build strength. You know, if you don't uh, give in to them, you know, a lot of people say, Lydia, oh my God, all that you passed, aren't you angry at the past? I says, no, you know, I am who I am because I, you know, each hurdle made yeah. me stronger. Yeah. Um, okay, I wanna ask you some more cooking questions, okay. uh, sort of. So. I, one of the things I love about your food is that you have this deep connection to ingredients always. It's very Italian. Um, but with that also, you have, your food is always seasonal. And you've always appreciated whole animals. You know, you cook with the, the off cuts and you serve organ meats and, and things like that. Do you feel like people really appreciate or understood that when you were doing it in the 80s? And, and have you, has that developed or just talk a little bit about that? Uh, I think, you know, I was raised in that, you know. Yeah. I mean, you know, Sunday grandma decided to do a chicken, Saturday we would chase the chicken around the, you know, I would corner it, she would catch it, and on, on, the, on the, the wooden stump she would, you know. Uh, but she would use everything uh, from the chicken, you know, she would make a big pot of soup, the legs and everything. And I vividly remember as a child, because, you know, as a child it's impressive, you know, the chickens kind of dig. And so under the nail, they have, and no matter how much you wash, that never comes off. So she used to put their hands like and chop off and all the, the fingernails, <laughs> chop off uh, all the fingernails, and then the rest of the of the the, the fit, food, uh, foot, and the and the and the head and the neck and everything went into a soup, a nice soup. Uh, and she would collect the fat and all that, and that skin, everything that went on. And then the rest, she would make a sauce, and she would make either gnocchi or or a uh, fresh pasta on, on, on Sunday. Mm -hmm. So I was, you know, growing up, um, for, for, for Easter, you know, especially around the time, we didn't eat all that, you respected the animals, we didn't have that much meat, you know. The two pigs had to last for a whole year in different cuts, whether it was in pancetta or sausages or whatever. But uh, Easter, you know, I, I said, we had goats, and goats have little kids, and I, uh, us, we used to play with the kids because kids are very, the, the goats are very funny. But, you know, then Easter came with the, the, the spring and there it was, you know, hanging and being skinned and all of that. And you kind of respect, you know, I have a great respect for these animals because these are animals, you know, you love them, you feed them, and ultimately they keep you alive. They kept us alive at the time uh, of, of that. So I think when I came to the, to the States, and uh, going in, in uh, although in Astoria they had butchers, and this is the neighborhood, they had butchers, and we had the Italian butchers, and they had tripe, and they had mm. liver, and all of that. So it wasn't completely uh, separated from that. But in the stores, in the regular uh, uh, grocery stores, everything was packaged and was, you know, either pieces. Um, although I remember necks and, and wings being there, because that's what my mother bought. You know, they were the cheapest, and. Uh, punch of necks would make a big pot of soup. And the and wings then, are the most delicious. And then we would nibble <laughs> on them with a little salt. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think that maybe the, uh, the American uh, uh, sort of culinary sentiments are coming back to, to that uh, reality of, uh, you know, um, who, what, what, what do we need as food? What do we treat it right? Does that, because also, rabbits, you know, my, my grandmother had rabbits and she kept the guy, the male, always separate. When she needed rabbits, she put the male together with the girls and we had more food, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was a whole pattern going on, you know. <laughs> but, but I tried in every restaurant, even in this book, I have a rabbit recipe. I, you know, rabbits is delicious, good meat, no fat, basically no fat. A rabbit is very environmentally uh, kind of friendly because what two uh, uh, two months you have from a baby you have a mature rabbit and you can eat you know feed with a rabbit a family of ten people no problem you know I mean if you make a sauce and and they don't consume all that much of our environment you know grass or whatever so if you if you really are conscious about 
the environment and everything else, then these kind of things should be looked at. If you want every day a big steak on your path, you know, it takes a, a, a calf, a cow, what, three years to, to develop to full, yeah. and all, how much grain and grass and all of that they have to eat to produce that steak. So I, I think that that's the point. We rarely ate, uh, you know, uh, uh, beef or something like that. We only, when the animal has a, was a certain age, and then it was only good for soup or for, or for uh, braisings or uh, goulash or things like that. And, and I think that the, the industrial situation, revolution actually here when uh, the women went to work and whatever, and big industry set in and began to prepare food for Americans to eat. I think that's when everything changed. And yes. even now, big industry, there's a lot of money. The, the food industry is the second largest employer in the United States. So, you know, you can't just shut it off. You know, how, you have to change the mentality of how, all of us, how you buy. And this is what's gonna drive any change, and it's a slow change. Because, you know, the big industry, they have lobbies, they have everything, they, there's a lot of money in this. So it's, 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 a, it's a, you know, who's right, who's wrong, whatever, we slowly have to uh, be cautious, as America is evermore. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you know, when I speak, the, only th the, the one thing that I can say is, your money can make the change. Buy the right thing. You know, buy, uh, whether it's organic, whether it's buy the next, buy, and buy something, buy it, use it all, and let your money speak for you. I, I absolutely agree. I always say that, you know, thank you. Uh, yeah, you know, you, can, you vote with your dollars. For every dollar that you spend with a farmer and not with the big industry, that's you saying that you want more of that. Mm -hmm. And it's important. So I, I just, I really do appreciate that for 25 years now, you know, beyond the restaurant, but as, as a cooking show host and, and someone that so many people listen to that this is something that you believe in so truly and, and speak about, it means a lot to me. Well, we have to, we yeah. see where the world is it's going, the future. we have to do it. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit more about your cooking because I had so much fun this week preparing for this. Uh, I spent a lot of time on YouTube watching some of your old cooking shows. I found that original MasterChef episode of you making the risotto for Julia and you have her to your home, and Felice is playing the accordion, and it is magical. You're singing. Well, let me tell you, let me tell you. So, so you know, in, in Italy, when you eat, <clears throat> uh, at the end, uh, you sing. So, you know, you just, it's everybody's happy, especially if there's holidays or something. My husband did play the accordion. He would brought it out. <clears throat> and we were singing sort of traditionally Italian song. Let me tell you, she was swaying and singing yeah. with us. She didn't know the words, but she was into it. <laughs> You must find this. It is it is online and it's a, it's beautiful. But so I so I'm watching uh, you know some of your earlier Lydia's t the the earliest of your your own PBS show, and I noticed that uh, you know you cook some traditional res Italian recipes that you've introduced people to. I love the episode with your mother where you're making the monkfish brodetto and she's talking about eating polenta, and it's it's beautiful. So things like that is like probably very foreign to most Americans at that time. And, but also, you know, you have episodes where you're cooking meatballs and you talk about how that is Italian American and not something from Italy. And, you know, me now, looking at your whole history of cooking, I, I feel like you've slowly developed your, your very individual style of cooking as kind of a hybrid now of Italian, traditional Italian and Italian American. Do you feel like maybe in the 90s when you were very important on PBS, trying to make Italian food accessible to Americans. Were you leaning into the Italian American cooking more, or do you think it's more just you becoming more American in time? No, it was just realizing the situation and appreciating, appreciating and knowing how am I going to make this switch? You know, you can't just make a 90 degree angle on a car. You have to yeah. kind of ease it in. So, so, uh, uh, but I also. Uh, really did research on the Italian American food and why is the Italian American food different than what I know the regions of Italy? Well, and I went to across the United States in, mm -hmm. in, in the uh, Italian American neighborhood, uh, in, in Kentucky, in uh, Kansas, all over. And um, the first big influx of Italian immigrants was at the ed end of the 1800s. And they basically came from Sicily, Calabria, 
in Campania, which is Naples, those three sudden. So the Italian-American food really reflects a lot the southern culture. Mm. But having said that, you know, as much as I talk about that a cuisine, the Italian cuisine depends on its products, they came here and they didn't have the products. Right. So the one thing that they did have, that they did find here was garlic. That's why the Italian-American cuisine is full of garlic. You go to Italy, we don't use a lot of garlic. And you know, it's, it's part of that reflection. The, the smell of cooking is, is garlic if, in an Italian household in America. Yes, but it's, you know, in, in Italy it is. We use garlic, mm -hmm. but we're much more modified mm -hmm. in a sense. Uh, we have, uh, let's say, the, the, the Sunday sauce. The Sunday sauce here. Now, the tomato. The tomato is an American product. It was brought to, to Europe with, the, with the Columbus, but the Italians, you know, they're farmers and whatever, the sun and whatever, the tomatoes, they got nice and ripe. They, got, they were smaller. The tomatoes in, in America was uh, pomodoro, a golden apple. They were not even all red. They were the initial, they were yellow. Oh, wow. and, and so it was, it was a bigger tomatoes. It was, uh, had a lot of juice and lots of seeds. And so the acidity was higher. Uh, the seeds have tannin and the sauce became more bitter. Hence, here in the sauce, they add sugar. Yeah. You never add sugar in Italy in your sauce. That's a, that's a no-no, uh, absolutely. So, you know, they were adopting. Also, the Sunday sauce. You know, here you have a Sunday sauce. You have bracciole, meatballs, sausages, pieces of pork. In Italy, it's not like, in Italy you have uh, maybe a piece of cotica. Cotica is the skin, the salted mm -hmm. skin, and a piece of fresh pork and the tomatoes. And that's that, and it doesn't cook three hours. That's the Sunday sauce, but why? Because these immigrants came to the United States and they didn't have meat in Italy. Here they found the abundance of meat. And hence, the Sunday sauce, they Full put everything they had. It was <laughs> their the way <laughs> of celebrating. And it still is, and it's a darn good sauce. I like it too, you know, and I have recipes for it and whatever. I actually went back and I, uh, uh, you know, picked up all the recipes and all of this and then worked at it. So that, um, you know, the two cuisines are parallel and yeah. they have a story. And it's a beautiful story uh, in a sense, you know, of immigrants adapting to, to a situation. And then of course, uh, then there are the reality of regional Italian cooking, 20 regions. And even in Italy, the regions differ. A pasta fagioli is different in Le Marche than it could be in the Veneto. There's a little differences. And you started traveling also around Italy as you, as you after coming here, oh. you started going back, right? So oh, I realized, I realized because I was young, I didn't know all of the regions. I yeah. knew some of the northern regions. Uh, uh, I went back, I went back and worked with chefs, back to schools also. You know, we would take the vacation, we would close the restaurant and uh, take a three-week three vacation with the kids and all that and whatever, and go visit the family and then I, each, each, vacation, different region, made appointment with different chefs, with wineries, whatever, to really and continue. It still continues to this day. I love that. Yeah, you know, in that, um, that original uh, master chef where you made the risotto for Julia, you also made the rocchiette with the, the sausage and the and broccoli. The broccoli. And that's, that's really a, a pouille, a southern dish, Pugliese. right? Yeah. Pugliese. I was, I was surprised to see you make that. It's one of my favorite dishes. I yeah, love it. Yeah, that's from Puglia, which is the heel of Italy. And, uh, um, you know, that was early, my thing. So uh, I had been there. I had learned that maybe a, a few years before that because that, we don't cook in the north right. that pasta. Yeah. But you now know, everything, Italy all over cooks, you know, all the pasta. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's blending it's, more. Well, we have you know, the, the internet. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Everybody knows yeah. everybody. Yeah, wow. Um, so, I, how are we doing on time? Are we good? A few more minutes? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, I have to say that uh, you've written over a dozen cookbooks, and right, more, yeah, more than twelve, I think. I tried to count. I couldn't 16. keep track. Sixteen. Oh my goodness! And children's books, and that beautiful memoir. I think it's safe to assume that this is a room full of readers. If you have not read her memoir, I highly recommend it. But. Uh, you know, I think that this cookbook, and maybe I'm just being partial because I get to talk to you about it, but <laughs> it feels really special to me. I feel like this cookbook feels like a celebration of your lifetime of cooking. Because I, I read through this and I see everything from, 
the, uh, there's the recipe for the Venetian style, the calves liver and polenta, which you had bravely on the menu at Felidia, is in this cookbook. And yeah. yet you have turkey meatballs and frigatoni. And there's a salad with avocado yeah. because your grandchildren love it. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. But this uh, is all Lydia. Well, the book, you know, uh, those of you that watch the show, my mother, who lived with me, who actually uh, helped me raise my children, and she was there when we opened the restaurants and all that, she passed two years ago. And this is, this is uh, in her honor. But uh, I get, you know, on, on the internet, I get a lot of social media, I get a lot of emails from my viewers. And I do read them, and I do... Uh, 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 sort of respond uh, to them. And there's, they want to know more about the family, you know, because my kids came on the show because we lived in the same house, my grandkids then came. So, you know, you saw, because it's been 25 years that I've been on television, so you saw my kids from little babies, grandkids, in the, in the kitchen with me and, and growing up. So I get the questions. Lydia, what are the favorite recipes that you cook in your family, for your family? What does Joe like? What does Miles like? What did, what's, what's grandma's favorite dish? And those are the dishes that I, that I have here. And they do transcend the traditional, yeah. the one from my grandmother, they transcend into the Italian American because, you know, my kids love chicken parmigiana. <laughs> so who doesn't? Who doesn't? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, and then on into the new addition. You know, the salads, of course, now they have kale salads with avocado, you know, it's, it is, this is the, the, the time. So that book reflects kind of this progression. We are lucky, uh, we're lucky, because you have you. collected all of these things and it's like, it's all you. Yeah. You know, it's, you've, you've become just, I don't know, a d you've evolved and, and this is so representative of it. Right, it's really right. beautiful. Yeah, it's, 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 I guess it's not, it's, I always say, uh, it's, it's not me, I always have a team. There's always somebody that works with me to make things happen and so that I can reflect these things because if I didn't have my grandkids to cook for or my, you know, you, you wouldn't come up come up this thing. But yes, I'm blessed, I get excited, I get driven by the opportunity of, of getting them all around the table and cooking for them and uh, when they, they call me or they tell me, no, you're gonna make this for me. <clears throat> I mean, I make soups now, I love making soups. And I have my whole freezer quartz. Mm -hmm. So uh, two, three kids, three of my grandkids are away at college. Two have a little apartment, they graduated and they have. And uh, when I come into the city or something, you know, with my little bag, I do, do drop-offs of frozen soups. <laughs> Nothing changes, you know. <laughs> Should I give you my address? <laughs> Okay, so we're going to let everyone else ask questions, but I'm going to ask you a cooking question first. So my favorite recipe that I have made, I, have, I showed you I dog-eared about uh, a dozen pages in this of recipes I'm excited to cook, but I have cooked a few of them. Um, I loved your vegetable polpette. The vegetable meatballs are so good. And I know that this is a surprise coming from the butcher, but uh, you know, I've been eating less meat lately and I just love to make meatballs. I told you I, my nieces love to cook with me and I get them to roll the meatballs, it's their favorite thing. So I wanna make that recipe uh, for my family sometime soon when I see them, but zucchini season is ending soon. Is there a vegetable that I can use in those meatballs? Another, something that uh, would work as well? Would you still use the potato? What? I think the potato is the kind of- The starch. Uh, the starch or, yeah. that keep the glue that keeps everything together. And I think that you could put in there whatever, whatever else. Uh, I think if you want to do even the Swiss chard. Ah, and, the, and, the and, and The greens and the side. Uh, the question is, you know, chop it or pass it through uh, 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 grinders, not too small, but so that they it molds, so that your polpetta, your meatball, doesn't crack open, okay. and the potatoes keep it together. So, but you can make it with anything. You know, I always say about my recipes, uh, you know, these are suggested products and whatever. But uh, the beauty of it, what I really is when when uh, you guys out there make the recipe follow my recipe, and then you go on your own. I encourage it, you know, what do you have in the house? Not always do you have in the house all the, all the, all the uh, uh, ingredients that I have in the recipes. So, you know, you improvise, yeah. absolutely. 
I made, uh, I loved the recipe for the chickpea and celery salad, but instead of the gorgonzola, I used a very nice local blue cheese. I thought you would appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. it. It was good. Um, Did you like it? I loved it. I loved it. I was actually on a recent, ep uh, recently looking at your old episodes, I watched you make a simple salad of just celery and artichoke. Yeah. And I've never eaten a raw artichoke. It blew my mind. I oh, need to do that. Oh, it's delicious. Oh. I would say, you know, in springtime, that's yeah. in the springtime. It's not the, the season. The small, the small artichokes, when they don't have the choke yet. Yeah. So that you could Those really, tiny ones. yeah. And then the best thing is, uh, you know, the mandolin, if you have to be careful. But I'm terrified of the mandolin. I always uh. wear the glove <laughs> or use the accessories. So yeah, I yeah, it could, it, yeah, you could really slip. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Uh, should we? We have a microphone going around. Do we have questions? Do we have questions from the audience? They'll they'll bring you a microphone so you can talk into it. We can all hear you. Philly is a big restaurant town. Where did you go to eat in Philly? Ah, good question. I didn't go any place. <laughs> so I came because they had me booked. I did. Uh, 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 I went to W H Y Y. I did. Uh, um, uh, what did I, I did a radio. And then I, we taped uh, a, a little discussion show. Then I went to Barnes and Nobles and st signed their stock. And then across the street from Barnes and Nobles, by then, you know, it was already 1, 1 32. They have like a, a, a baguette place, uh, you know? Oh, so you I, had, to, I you had a Metropolitan Bakery possibly? No, it was just oh, across, okay. was just across from, ah. from Barnes and Nobles. And my car was right there. So I got a, a tuna sandwich, how's that? <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you eat Italian food when you travel or do you like to experience other things? Uh, I like to experience everything, but you know, uh, uh, I'm a little bit more uh, finicky with Italian food, so mm. I have to really be that's, ready. That's what I thought. But uh, a tuna salad, you know, okay. Yeah, it doesn't disappoint. Uh, no, no, <laughs> and I like, I like tuna. I feel so blessed to be able to come to see you tonight. Uh, oh, it's my birthday. This is a gift for my daughter. Ah, Dennis, happy thank birthday. <laughs> I watched all your shows, read all your books, and you're a gift to the world. I was figuring somehow scheming to get into one of your restaurants to run into you sometime. Of course, that would be impossible. But I really wanted to thank you for being you and bringing it forward to us. And my wife says, you read all her stuff and you watch her shows all the time. I watched even before I came here today, but you never cook. I, said, no. <laughs> I watch the golf channel, I don't golf. <laughs> but I think a big part of your show and what you represent and as valuable as your cooking is your family values. When I see you talk to your mother, your family gatherings, it's just very, very special. Well, thank you, thank you, because thank you. that is all part. Yeah. Uh, that is all part of who I am, what, what I believe in, and what I want to communicate. You see, as I said, I came here as a, as a young immigrant, uh, and I have a, a beautiful uh, culture that I was born in. But then I was blessed and accepted in the American culture. And, uh, you know, I, I am forever grateful to be here, to have been accepted, and, uh, you know, I always find this, that maybe with food, with the family, I can connect my native country with my adaptive country. It makes it, you know, it's like you want to make family connect. And that's, that's what I, I get, uh, uh, I, I get um, even, even emotional, but I am very grateful that I'm given this opportunity. And uh, uh, one would say, did you plan this? I didn't plan this, you know, I loved cooking. It was a, a sentimental thing that developed into, oh, I can do this. Oh, then I can be successful at this. The restaurant was successful. So also within all of this is the emotional, but it's also the financial, and we were talking about that. You know, made me uh, live well, have a nice house. Uh, the family, they got, everybody got educated. So uh, I, in, bringing, in bringing this thing, but beyond that, my, my values are that. Because in the process of coming here, uh, uh, in the camp, we were just the four of us, the family, I had left all my family. You kind of, the Italians anyway, need that kind of group support. But specifically, our trips has made me understand how important family is. And then what I saw was in, in, the, in, the, um, 
emails that I get from you and all of that, is that uh, you know people were longing for that. Somehow, the modern world has scattered people, and uh, the table can bring people together. You know, if you make a good meal, and it doesn't have to be a, 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 a three or four course meal, but a good meal, a good plate of pasta or a chicken parmigiana, or whatever, and if you offer that they will come, you know, if you cook, they will come. The table brings people together. So, you know, I, I felt this, this almost oh, little power. Oh my God, you know, if I tell you to do this, they'll come, so, so do it. And, uh, and uh, you know, out there, there's really a, a kind of a, I feel the sensibility that people are really getting back together and that's what America is looking for. You know, let's get back together. Let's get with the family. Let's, be, let's respect that and of course, uh, if I even had a, a, a little platform, you know, in that saying, uh, uh, I am very honored. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dennis. I'm just curious about the songs that Grandma sings at the end of your <laughs> shows. Mm -hmm. Are the words written anywhere? That I'd just be interested in. Um, we don't have them written, but that's an idea. But they, they are traditional uh, kind of songs. You know, um, uh, every culture has the songs where they're sort of express in a very folkloristic way their, their passion, their happiness, their sorrows, and whatever. And these songs that she sings uh, reflect that, you know. Family life. One one of them, and and, and I'll trans, translate. And she, uh, bevevano i nostri padri, bevevano le nostre madri, e noi che figli siamo, beviamo, beviamo, beviamo. So you know, this usually gets sung at the end when everybody's happy. Has a, so the question is, did our fathers drink? Yes. Did our mother drink? Yes. And we are the sons and daughters, so let's continue to drink. And so. <laughs> So that reinforces, you know, after you're at the table with everybody, you just go, but, but that's all. And it has a nice rhythm and whatever. Uh, but um, yes, she, she passed away because she was always part of the show. She would come down. She lived upstairs. She would come down. She would come on the show. She would taste. And so I, I you know, I just couldn't leave her out because she's gone. And uh, I have at the end little snippets of her, whether she sings. And we're going to continue to do that. And people love that. They, they, they sent me, uh, you know, they, they write to me and say that they love seeing Grandma at the end. So she's always part of us singing. I love that. Um, so I have a food question for actually both of you, because I think it would be a good butcher question too. I am a firm believer in my heart of the whole nose to tail concept, not letting any part of an animal go to waste. but. I have struggled to find any kind of awful, awful that I enjoy eating, which makes me even more resident to tr resident to try and cook it, reticent. Um, so my question is, if either of you have any suggestions for a cut or a recipe that might be a good intro to awful. Did you want to answer that first? I, I have some answers. Uh, Go ahead. So. First of all, great. We should all eat from nose to tail if we're going to eat animals. Um, but I, talk to, I would talk to my customers at the counter about this a lot. And I think that people have a hard time with the liver and the kidneys because that iron flavor is very intense. Um, heart. Heart is delicious. Heart is a muscle. So it's a little bit more similar to what you're used to in meat than the, the more different textures of the liver and the kidney. And it's a milder. It's more like eating a hanger steak. There's a touch of iron, but maybe. And I, I think you can cook heart so many ways. Um, you, can, you can eat it raw or rare, like in a tartare, but you could also grind it and add it to your meatballs. And then everybody's eating a little organ meat, and they're getting a little extra iron, and they don't know. <laughs> also tongues. Tongues, I don't know, uh, do, you, do you have any traditional recipes that you would cook with tongue? But tongue is well, also a muscle, so it, it cooked, tastes like a pot roast. Yeah, we, we always cook. We cooked every part yeah. of the animal. Um, also these, the innards. And all of these, the offals, are the first part, uh, they go bad the mm. fastest. And so they, they need to be sold the fast. That's why when we slaughter an animal, uh, my parents, the first thing was the blood, you cook the blood. And then you go on with the, with the liver, that's very perishable and so on. And so you, you eat, so uh, sometimes it's difficult, I guess, 
you know, uh, it doesn't keep more than, I would say, one or two days. So to find it two, three days, once you freeze it, uh, whether it's liver or whatever, it te changes textures and it's different. So it is, it is uh, difficult to get this, this offals at, at, at a good uh, time in, in, in their sort of uh, being fresh. Uh, um, the the uh, tripe, that's one that keeps because they give it one boiling first. So, you know, so if you buy the tripe, the tripe has been uh, uh, boiled already once and then you should cook it again. And sometimes they even put a little bit of chlorine in there to mm. serve because it's an antibacterial and whatever and they, they clean it. Uh, they clean it. So some, some innards and all of that are ears are cured, tongue can be cured, and their life, their, their sort of freshness can be extended. But uh, a lot of the offals need to be super fresh too. Oxtails are good, you know, oh, yeah. do you consider them or not? Uh, that's, uh, so ear, tongue could, could, could survive a little bit. The kidneys are not, are not bad. But you know the kidneys always have that kind of the texture. But also the urine flavor, it's, oh, it's, yeah. it's there, it's permeating the whole thing. So you have, to, you have to soak it in vinegar and whatever. You have to also know the treatments to, to, for those, those offals to get them to a, a palatable, you know. Uh, I mean, for us, we were somewhat used to, but today, you know, uh, a kidney really stands out if you're not yeah. used to. <laughs> and you need to know, you need to know how to, how to soak it in vinegar and, 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 then, and then, of course, cook it with, again, mustard or something like that that really gives yeah. it gives it i think my advice is to use lydia's recipes honestly because <laughs> because it's true like having any of those things not cooked well will turn you off of them forever and i noticed in your recipe for the liver uh, the Venetian style mm -hmm. liver that uh, you, you cook it separately so that you don't overcook it and you keep it kind of rare and then you add it because if you overcook it at all the texture becomes right. kind of gritty and it's terrible. So she does have some, I would say maybe if you try her liver recipe you might like it and also use a lot of fat, right? The yeah. trick to I think making the the rich irony taste of the liver and thing tastes good is like butter and cream. Yeah, and, and you know here... Uh, That's also, why everybody loves a pate. <laughs> onions, Veneziana, oh, yes. lots of onions, the sweetness, the sweetness and whatever. of the onions. But it's also knowing how to, now, being a butcher, how to treat the organ, the liver. You have to go in and get the veins out. You know, you get slices of lung, but then you see the veins and all this. And also, it has a skin on the outside that you have to peel off. And you have to, otherwise, you know, you encounter this, all this uh, resistance in yeah. your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but you need, so, so it's, you know, it's uh, awful maybe t need more attention yeah. than the other cuts to, to prepare. But yeah, sneak some heart into your, into your cooking. Heart's, heart is good. Heart is good, right? Very good. Yeah. yeah. Um, so like you said, you've been doing this for 25 years. That means women like me here in America, I've been watching you since I was a child. And um, not only were you able to instill the love of food in me and the confidence in food that I became a professional chef and was able to work in food styling and TV, when did you come to realize your reach when going from um, opening restaurants here in America to knowing um, the position it would put you in to really touch women like me and inspire us to become chefs ourselves? Um, it's, it's, it's a progression. It's, it's a, and taking the opportunities or the roads when they come and, and when you do decide to take a road, I mean, look at all of the opportunities. Don't just uh, make sure that you are prepared for that road that you want to take. And if you're not, then you need to invest again in yourself or maybe surround yourself with, with people that, that could. But you have, to, you have to believe in yourself. You have to have trust. You have to be prepared. You have to be professional. You have to be good at what you want to be. And if you're not there, then you continue, it's like schooling, I continue schooling. I continuously, you know, go back to Italy, as I said, but, uh, you know, work with chefs, I'm always curious to see what everybody, what other chefs are, but um, don't be uh, uh, afraid to look at an opportunity and possibly think of an opportunity. The one thing that, that uh, is, is um, ele elementary here in the whole thing is that, yes, you have a passion, you, you, you love doing something, but unless you are successful financially, and we discussed that, you don't have a platform. 
You need to be, because in America, success is judged by financial being, you, you, you made it, you, you live well, and whatever. It's not necessarily what is right or whatever, but especially in an industry like ours. So you have to also really um, surround yourself or be financially conscious, you know? Make sure that the next step you are successful, that, you know, the, the financial element that gets you out there. So you have a good product, you have something to give, you have a, um, an exchange with your, with your audience because it has to be, uh, you know, it has to be, it's not all yours or whatever. You have to give value, quality, and also a setting if you're dealing with food for your customers to come back. They have to feel comfortable. They have to like what you do. You have to be open to what they say. So there's a lot of things in elements. I think that also being um, accepting and humble and, 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 you know, listening to people, they will kind of tell you where you want to go. But I would encourage you, you know, don't be afraid. Invest in yourself, surround yourself with the right people and make that first step. The first step will turn into second step and so on down the line. I wish you good luck. A bit early, so I had the chance to read the introduction to the book and the love you have for your family, your grandchildren, your mom, your kids, really comes through. And you talk about what your mom's favorite dishes were and what the kids love, Lorenzo's favorite, Ethan's favorite, and so on. But what's your favorite? <laughs> ah, what a great final question. What, if you could pick just one, I know it's like asking you just to pick your like favorite child. It's like asking me, what's your, what's yeah. your favorite child? Oh, I, I know. At different times, um, you know. Today. <laughs> you know, you had, you had a tuna fish sandwich for lunch. If you could make dinner out of this cookbook, what, what recipe would you make? I don't know. I can go for a linguine clam sauce. Tonight. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> I like always. It. But it's all about the seasonality. You know what? I I get uh, kind of excited and driven even in cooking. But what I see, the food. It's you know, the recipes are there. But when I see something, that kind of drives me to really want to cook when I see something real good. So now, you know, I'm, I'm getting into, into soups. I love making soups. Uh, uh, you know, I love the whole squash family. The porcinis are coming out, lot, lots of good mushrooms. So there's a lot to be done now in the fall. And uh, uh, when a product is good, then I respond to that product. I love that. I just made my first soup of the season today. And also, the farmer's market is my favorite place on earth. You go there and, and you're inspired to It tells to cook. you what to cook. Yeah, ah, I love it. Heather, I'm gonna take a moment now and I'm gonna, <laughs> and I'm gonna uh, tell you how, how much I appreciate you as a woman. Thank you. As a woman choosing a profession that unlike mine maybe, but yours is even harder for a woman a butcher. Uh, I spoke to people how much you are appreciated in this city and how much you have done for the city and the farmers. So I want to congratulate you. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> you're going to make me cry. <laughs> I, I just want to, Lydia, it has been like a joy, a huge joy for me to get to know you in advance of meeting you today and just reading your stories and spending time rewatching your shows. I mean, you were, you were such a beautiful person. And I, as I was making my notes and thinking about asking you, I kept thinking that you seem so brave. And uh, you are, but I think really you're generous. And, and I think that, that we all feel that. And your, and your generosity and your love for food and family is like, you have just, for decades now, you've been sharing that. And it, it is so special. It really is. Well, thank you, Heather. Yeah. Thank we're you. so lucky to have you. Thank you.